All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, yet another, another edition of the Continuing Metrans Seminar Series, Solving Metropolitan Transportation Problems. Um, we've got a special speaker today, Ron Milam from Fair and Pierce. Um, let's see, Ron told me he's um, an environmental policy and planning graduate from UC Davis, right, with a focus on land use uh, land use and transportation planning? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Um, Davis is one of my favorite institutions. It isn't USC, so I know he comes to us high, highly qualified. Uh, and he's worked with a bunch of folks whom we, we know, uh, a bunch of faculty at uh, various UC campuses. Um, also, he uh, is an instructor with um, is it UC Berkeley Extension. Um, Their tech transfer. Tech transfer, that's yeah. right. Forgive me. Um, USC considered really getting into the extension business about 30 years ago, but UCLA had cleaned our clock with UCLA extension, and it stayed relatively clean for the last 30 years. Um, so I'm glad you have that opportunity, and if we get better at extension, I'll, I'll, we'll offer you the same opportunities. <laughs> All right. So um, Ron is the um, director of research at Farron Piers, and let's see, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around how much you're doing. Director of Evolving the Status Quo, and leads the company's research and development. Um, he, his work focuses on thinking long term and helping clients understand future outcomes of their decisions. If there's any place on the planet that needs a greater investment on long term thinking, it is the University of Southern California right now. Uh, his recent work's focused on travel market priorities, uh, disruptive trends such as internet shopping and automated vehicles, uh, big data, which is, of course, um, intruded on all of our lives in a big way. Um, I've listened to Ron's presentations before. I know they're very good. Um, I, he, I, I asked him if he would come visit us the next time he was in town, and he said yes, and here he is, and we're very grateful to Metrans and to Vicki for getting this all put together, and I think we'll have a really good talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, and as my favorite topic, I really like to engage in conversation about the topic. So as I present, I will encourage you to ask questions as we go. Uh, we've got plenty of time today to get through the whole presentation. And one of the things I'm here for is to learn from you in terms of the types of questions you have about the future of travel and how that might not affect, just not only affect you personally, but um, also long range planning. That's what we engage in with clients as a consultant. So what you're gonna hear today in terms of a presentation about disruptive trends is largely uh, a result of our own research. And that research is something that's unique at Fair and Peers because we self-fund our research. We do work with academic partners. Um, a number of professors help us in a lot of our research projects. Um, and they're tailored to listening closely to the types of questions our clients have about the future. If you think about cities and counties, uh, State Department of Transportation or transit agencies, they all make largely significant infrastructure investments um, with public tax dollars, and they need certainty that the outcomes they desire will occur as a result of making those investments. Over the last 50, 60 years, that's been pretty straightforward. We had relatively consistent population employment growth in the U.S., and infrastructure planning was largely just trying to keep pace with what was happening with the population and employment growth. Well, welcome to today. The future looks a little more uncertain. Um, it's very difficult to predict um, how some of the technology changes are going to influence travel. Um, so that's one of the particular variables we're going to spend a little bit of time today on. Um, but how we got here uh, was through a research project. We actually started back in 2012. Um, at this time, uh, we were coming out of the Great Recession, and our clients were asking a variety of new questions. They understood there was a change happening, and they wanted to better understand how that change was affecting our ability to forecast the future and bring certainty to some of their larger investment decisions. <coughs> Bless you. And so when we started this research, we identified 16 different trend variables at the time that we thought would influence the future of travel, specifically related to things like transit ridership and vehicle travel. I don't have time today to go through all 16 uh, different variables. We'll spend a lot of time, though, on things like transportation network companies, shared mobility, and then aut autonomous vehicles. Those are some of, the, some of the bigger ones. And why this was uh, particularly important at this time, uh, especially here in California. You know, California, if you go all the way back to 2006, that's when we passed AB 32, our first climate change law. Um, 
we had a bunch of laws that came on its heels that affect us in the land use and transportation sector. And we wanted to understand some variables um, in particular like VMT, vehicle miles traveled. We wanted to understand what was happening um, in terms of the background, how technology um, and some of the uh, disruptive changes were affecting it. And this is what we came up with. Um, if you see here, you've basically got this trend line that goes all the way back to 1970 where VMT growth largely mirrored economic growth. So VMT per capita and GDP per capita, gross domestic product, were, were largely aligned. And we had a decoupling in about 2004 at the national level. Some states were a little before that, some a little after. Now recognize, this is before the Great Recession. So we had this decoupling event, and we didn't quite know why. And then the Great Recession came along and accelerated some of that decoupling. Um, and we got to a point in 2012 where we were starting to do this research, and we realized, wow, where we go from here is wildly uncertain. Um, we could have a future in which we don't use vehicles as much because we share them, um, or we could have a world in which uh, we all have our own private autonomous vehicles, and they drive around a lot without us, um, doing all kinds of, uh, of activities. Um, so the range up here from a low of about 10,000 VMT per capita to as high as 17,000 per capita, that's a very difficult range for the public sector to deal with when trying to make investment decisions. Um, you know, if you put this in terms of trying to make a decision, do I add lanes to the freeway or do I build this, this new light rail line, those are the kinds of decisions they're faced with, and this is a, a pretty large range of uncertainty. So part of this research was to say, hey, how can we shrink that range? Are there things that we can investigate to understand some of the phenomena a little bit better? And so we dug into the, the trends themselves uh, and tried to look backwards in time to see if we could better understand some of these relationships. As I mentioned, you can go all the way back to 1970 and you see this somewhat um, consistent pattern here of this upward trending line. You see the decoupling in about 2004. Um, and then we see a little bit of the recovery after the recession with VMT trending upwards. Uh, so when we looked at the 16 different trend variables, some of them were pretty clear in terms of the relationship. When you have things like low fuel prices, guess what? We all drive more. Um, if you have high fuel prices, um, we'll start to carpool and share rides. Um, one little anecdotal story. Um, anybody remember what happened in the summer of 2008 when it came to fuel prices? What was going on in 2008? Anybody want to guess at the price of a, gas, a gallon of gas? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, instead of buying SUVs, people are buying smaller vehicles. Yeah. yeah. And do you remember what the price of a gallon of gas was in Southern California at that time? Five dollars. Um, so my, my experience was um, I had kids playing soccer at that time. And for soccer games, if you're a parent, you have to get the kid there an hour early. But both parents don't want to have to sit through an hour of watching them run around not doing much. So the other parent would drive separately um, and, and arrive at game time. So two parents, two vehicles, every game. Summer of 2008, we were seeing two families show up in the same minivan an hour early because of the cost of gas. So it has an effect. Um, so as we explored these effects, uh, we also wanted to look forward and look at what was going on right around us. Now, this is about the time that the uh, transportation network companies, Uber and Lyft, started. So we started to pay attention to some of the evidence and research that was coming out from others. Um, here's one of those examples from UC Davis. Um, they looked at the passengers in TNCs and asked them, if you didn't have access to this TNC, what would you have otherwise done? What mode would you have taken? And what we found here was about 60% of the TNC trips were brand new vehicle trips. These were vehicle trips that wouldn't have otherwise occurred. Well, guess what? When we do uh, future planning, we use models that don't include today TNCs. They are not a modal option in most of the models used here in California or any other state. Um, so we had a blind spot in our models about this particular element. So we knew we needed to do a better job of capturing the modal changes that were, were happening. Now this is still a vehicle mode, but it's a new type of vehicle mode. So we needed to make sure that we, we understood this uh, particular aspect. Uh, we also wanted to better understand what was happening with transit. Um, you know, as someone that, that builds models, um, you know, if I'm building models uh, historically and we look at something like transit ridership and we look at variables that, that influence transit ridership, employment's one of them. Um, if employment increases, we could usually count on transit ridership going up. Well, welcome to today. Those patterns no longer hold. 
This is, uh, I think, one of my favorite charts to show how transit ridership has changed over time. And, you know, if you're building a model, you, you want your independent and dependent variables, you know, to largely be, be connected. Um, and you want to understand which direction those variables move. Well, it's about 2015, we started to see this national decline in transit ridership. At the same time, employment was starting to take off. Um, in fact, in every major, major metropolitan area in the U.S., we had increasing employment and decreasing transit ridership, with the exception of Seattle. Um, Seattle largely made very significant investments in their transit system that led to continued expansion of transit ridership. But for everybody else, we saw this pattern. It's very difficult for me to now build a model off this kind of data. If I built a model today, I would predict that transit ridership would go down if employment goes up. Um, that's not a very reasonable model at this point in time. So the other thing we were looking for was evidence of what we call tipping points. Was there something unique that happened that really helps us to understand why um, we had such a disruptive change to, to travel patterns or travel amounts? And this slide tries to capture that and also predict for you in the future what's coming as possibly the next tipping point. So if you look at the top, the blue lines here, um, looking at accessibility to vehicles. Um, if you go back to uh, you know, early uh, 20, uh, 2013, 2012, Accessing a vehicle means you had to own it, you had to rent it for an entire day, um, or you took a taxi. Those were, were largely your options in, in most parts of the, the country. But something happened uh, there around the 2012-2013 time frame. Um, we started to create sharing opportunities. We could share vehicles. Anybody ever use a, a zip car um, or a car you could rent you know, by the hour, a micro rental? Um, well, that was a new way to access vehicles for a very short period of time. It lowered the price point, so more people had access to those vehicles. Well, if you look at the green lines, look at what else happened through that concept of sharing that was made possible by the technology and allowing our phones to serve as a gateway key, if you will, to these modes. We not only had car share, we had bike share. We had different forms of car share, one-way versus two-way. Um, we had the TNCs, then we followed that with microtransit, uh, e-scooters, uh, e-bikes. We've had this explosions of different ways to make our trip from point A to point B. So what's coming next as we look forward? Well, the future, we think the autonomy. And whether that autonomy comes to us in the form of autonomous transit or autonomous private vehicles, um, those are some of the, the things we're still exploring. But we do think this is a bit of a tipping point because the minute you go autonomous, you really reduce the cost of using vehicles. You no longer have what we call the, the value of time spent driving. You're not driving. You can do other things with that time. You also potentially lower the cost of operating the vehicle as well. Um, so those are factors that are, again, going to be a tipping point. And one of the fun things about planning is we get to anticipate change. And for any of the policy folks in the room, the idea is to craft policies and sometimes even regulations that help us ensure that our future outcomes um, are going to be aligned with the community values that, uh, um, that are expressed in the places that we work. And to do that is, is one of the unique challenges of planning. Too much of the, the planning work that even firms like us do today is what I call reactive. A problem showed up and people realized that now we have a problem, we better plan to fix the problem. So, well, that's not really planning. Planning is anticipating autonomy is coming. And how do we create an autonomous future that is the kind that our communities would like to see as a desired outcome? So we're going to spend some time on that a little bit later in the presentation. And in terms of this tipping point, though, big question, when is it coming? Uh, and this is fascinating to me because it is an essential question. Um, and it used to be a question that, as we looked at plenty of other experts, um, we kind of saw them clustering around a particular set of ranges you know, maybe by, um, you know, 2040, we get to where 20 to as high as 80 percent of the, the fleet um, could be autonomous. Um, but as we looked at some of these people uh, and some of these, these groups that were making forecasts, some are better than others. Um, and there's one disruptive trend forecaster that has a, a bit of a track record. Um, anybody familiar with Tony Seba? Um, Tony Seba writes on this subject. Uh, and he made this forecast at um, the 2018 uh, annual uh, TRB meeting that 95% of passenger travel um, 
by 2030 would del be delivered in, in what looks like TNCs, transportation as a service, mobility as a service, um, and autonomous electric vehicles. So let's break this apart. Um, let's just say he's half right on the electrification side. Um, how we fund transportation today is largely through gas tax revenue. Um, there's a bit of borrowing that goes on as well. So to the extent that we are looking at gas tax revenue declines because of electrification, that's a big disruptor by itself, even if he's only half right. If he's fully correct here, that's a very large disruption. If he's also correct about the level of autonomy um, that we're going to be seeing by this, this time frame, that's a drastic difference. Um, and, and if you look for comparisons, one of the ones that, that Tony likes to use is that if you think about um, how quickly we went from all horses to all cars. Anybody have a guess as to how many years that took? 30 years? Three? Ten. Ten? If we took the average of that, we'd be close. About 15. So if you take, you know, there's, he's got a great series of pictures that shows, uh, I think it was in New York, um, shows a street basically filled with nothing but horses. And 15 years later, there's only one horse. <laughs> it's all cars. Um, so these things can happen as quickly as Tony is, is predicting. And the question is, for us to anticipate, if the change comes this quickly, are we prepared? What policies, what regulations should we have in place today to, again, um, create the kind of desired outcomes that we want in our communities? So one of the things we thought we could do to help contribute to that conversation was to see to what extent can we quantify these effects. Um, if we know they're coming, and we know basic effects such as you no longer have to park your vehicle, you no longer have to pay parking costs, you're not spending time driving, the value of time spent driving is going to decrease. Um, theoretically, freeway capacity will go up because the vehicles are able to operate um, with closer headways. So we took all this, we went into our modeling shop, um, and we've tested so far 10 regional travel demand models. Now, regional travel demand models, these are models that are used by metropolitan planning organizations uh, in the U.S. They're used to forecast traffic volumes and transit ridership, typically for 20-year trend, uh, trend periods. Um, and we use 10 different ones from around the country. So we have some from very big uh, regions. Um, all of these are, are metropolitan regions, though. We also um, analyzed two freeway simulation models to help provide the inputs to those models. We call those models macro-level models. Um, they are, for example, there's a, um, in the Southern California region, Southern California Association of Governments um, covers the entire SoCal area except for San Diego. So it's a very large area. Um, that's the type of macro-level model we're using. These freeway simulation models are models we built for Caltrans, um, for Caltrans projects. And what they allow us to do is test the effect of what happens if cars are able to drive closer together, a smaller headway. You can fit more cars through the same physical space and time um, if they consume less space. And so we can actually quantify that. So we quantify that and we plug that into these travel demand models. Now part of our um, uh, motivation here was to stress the models, um, to see if the models were actually capable of answering these types of technical questions. Um, so this is to help inform our model development um, uh, processes at Fair and Peers. At the same time, it's to see if we can actually quantify some of these effects. And drum roll, please. We could. Um, and you can go to our website. We do have a website uh, dedicated to our AV research. You can take a look at it. Um, these results will be updated over time. We started with seven models. We've quickly grown to 10. Um, and we've changed the types of models. Um, if you're a modeler, um, we have all kinds of different types of models, simple models, such as trip-based models, and very complex models known as activity-based models. We've tested both kinds to, to understand if the modeling platform makes a difference. So you can see that in the different types of circles. As to the effects themselves, what we found is that, yes, if you uh, were to lower the cost of using vehicles and make it more convenient, you're going door to door, you're no longer paying for parking, you're no longer having to park the car and walk to your final destination, you're going to get more vehicle travel. In some cases, a lot more vehicle travel. So vehicle trips goes up, the distance of the trips gets longer, people can basically live farther away potentially, or choose to go to destinations farther away, um, and you uh, increase VMT substantially. Now, this is California. So we should reflect on that VMT increase for just a moment. Um, the state has a goal of reducing VMT because of greenhouse gases. Uh, in fact, uh, the California Air Resources Board has estimated that 
uh, we need somewhere on the order of magnitude of about 25% decrease in VMT per capita um, by 2050 to hit our state greenhouse gas goals. So all of us need to be driving a whole lot less. We can't be going in this direction. So this is a threat or a risk to the state goals on greenhouse gases. So that's one way to look at this particular lens and to think about it from a policy standpoint, what should we be doing differently if we don't like this outcome? Now let's also take a look at transit ridership because we also tested transit. If VMT goes up, that means there's probably more people using vehicles. Um, it also means that transit's going down. There was only one model that showed any increase in transit and we left that model in the data set. It's the least sensitive model we tested. Um, what that means is that it didn't have feedback loops to recognize that if you make vehicle travel lower cost, more convenient, that the feedback process should result in more people traveling by vehicle. Um, it did not have that particular effect built into it, so it does show that there uh, is an increase. Um, it's not a, um, an increase that we think is reasonable, but we also don't like to throw out data points. So it's in the chart, but you can see some pretty substantial decreases um, in transit. Bus transit definitely gonna, is going to suffer. Um, it's possible that rail transit could actually uh, um, increase in some situations. We did do some individual tests on fixed rail lines where if the autonomous vehicles are used to serve the stations, so you have this new very low cost vehicle accessing stations, you could improve what we typically refer to as first mile, last mile. Everybody heard that term in planning school, hopefully? Okay. AVs, think about first three mile, last three mile. You expand the footprint of that access to the station. So one of the potential benefits, and if you increase that kind of accessibility, you could see increases in rail ridership. This all depends on what happens on the freeway system. I just mentioned that you know, as the headways between vehicles shortens, we could get more vehicles through the same freeway lane. In theory, that sounds great. Now we're practitioners, so we gotta look at this in a little bit more detail. Have we designed our interchanges so that all those extra vehicles that can get through, can they get off at the off-ramp? The answer is no. Um, off-ramps are still controlled by signals. There's only a limited amount of green time. For the comfort of the passengers, we're probably not going to accelerate from the stop bar any faster than we do today. The vehicles are capable of that, but we're not going to be putting you in your seat uh, as they scream away from the stop bar. So we have a design problem with current interchanges. If we are going to increase the throughput by maybe as much as 50% on the freeway, we need to find a way to get those vehicles off at those off ramps and onto the signal, signalized arterial corridors in a much more effective way than we do today. So it's not a given that freeway capacity is, is going to go up without some type of consequence um, such as the, the off ramp problem that I just described. So this is our research. Yeah, question? A quick question. So what is the penetration rate that you're using right now? Is it 100% or because that's also going to play a big role? Yeah, so in the macro level modeling, we did do 100%. Um, but in subsequent modeling, and it's on the web page, we have tested what happens when you have 10%, 20%, 30%. What does that do to freeway capacity throughput, for example? It's somewhat linear in general. Although there is a fantastic uh, presentation from Alex Bairn from UC Berkeley on his flow model, where they use autonomous vehicles as a, I'm going to call it a traffic calming device. Um, um, the controller of the thing. Yeah, so the, basically what happens, if you've ever seen the video of a bunch of cars driven by humans going in a circle, they can't maintain the headways because you got human, you know, behavior going on, some are going too fast, some are going too slow, and they start to bunch up. Um, Alex's model basically allows the autonomous vehicle to optimize the flow. And he's gotten to a point where he's doing full simulations using like the, the, the I-80 Bay Bridge in San Francisco and demonstrating how you can reduce the delay in queuing by just adding more vehicles, autonomous vehicles, into the traffic flow and using them as basically um, optimizers. And what's amazing to me is they're not following a set of modeling um, behaviors. They're giving some very simple rules about how to follow the car in front of them as it relates to optimizing flow, and they're self-learning. Um, and they don't even know how to explain why the vehicle does what it does, but the end result is it does optimize flow for that particular condition. So, um, he was so bold at TRB this year to predict that within five to ten years, 
that will be the way that we manage freeway flow. We will not be using ramp meters um, or active transportation management systems. Um, you will just introduce additional autonomous vehicles into the flow. Now, that might be a hard sell if I walked into most public agencies and said, hey, I can fix all your queuing problems. We just need to add some more vehicles. They're, they're probably going to struggle with that concept. Uh, his simulations help, and they are online. He's got some good YouTube videos if you want to check them out. All right, so part of our research is we don't do this in a, in a, in a, in a box. We, we, we look for evidence from others, especially uh, academia. Uh, UC Berkeley did what we call the chauffeur experiment. This was a nice piece of work where it's a small sample. It's only t 13 test subjects. But they gave these test subjects free chauffeur service for a week and tested how did they respond. Now, in the results I just showed you, we did not account for what we call zero occupant trips, where the, where the autonomous vehicle may be moving between passengers to go pick up a new passenger. They did. They showed basically a 76% increase in VMT. And despite being in the Bay Area, these people completely abandoned things like transit use. Um, so a much larger effect than we measured. Now, we didn't account for that zero occupant trip, so that's part of the explanation. Um, we also, neither test has looked at long-term land use effects. If you no longer have the value of time driving and you can do lots of other things, depending on how the vehicle is designed, um, people may be willing to spend a lot more time in, uh, in, in travel, basically. This also has implications, very fun policy implications for anybody that's dealing with pricing, which that's been talked about here in Southern California. Um, what happens to trying to use congestion pricing if people don't care the fact they're sitting in congestion because they're in this well-designed vehicle doing lots of other things? Um, you know, their value of time has gone down, so they're not sensitive to the fact that there is a price. Uh, so those are things we need to think about, and we need to think about them today if we want to get to an outcome 10, 15, 20 years from now that's uh, different. Yes? So in regards to this, the chauffeur experiment, um, it was free, right, for how long? One week. One week. So what about including the fact that if it isn't free? I mean, I understand what this was yeah. saying, but it's just about accessibility of these autonomous vehicles. Like, I can't afford one right now. Who knows in 15 years? But it seems to be that a certain subset of people will be able to afford those vehicles in 15, 20 years. So are you, are you guys accounting for that? Yeah, so there, there's kind of a couple steps to this. The next step is... Um, let's get a bigger sample size. So one of the studies that uh, AR, uh, ARB and SACOG um, are thinking about doing is extending this research to 100 households for at least two weeks in the SACOG region. So we, we get, get rid of that effect of, hey, you know, I'm getting to try this thing for the first time. I want to show everyone I'm driving around in a limo. Um, let's put them in not limos, but in, in you know, different kinds of small cars still with a, with a free driver, test the effect. So that gives us kind of um, the, the end of the range of effect. Um, obviously, because it's free, it's going to be at the high end of the range. So we start to work from that range back into, well, there's going to be a cost. Where is that cost point? And the cost point is one of the tough ones because it does depend on, are you going to buy one of these or are you going to share it? Are you going to use it as an Uber or Lyft, basically, that just costs you a lot less per mile than Uber and Lyft does today? So those are additional uh, research questions that, yeah, we don't have the answers to those yet. Any other questions of that? Yeah. So what about destination? So as in, a lot more people are working from home now. So how, how does that factor in? Or does it not really? Um, no, it does. So in most of the MPO models, they look at telecommute trends, and they do make adjustments over time. And in the case of, of some of the models, it's pretty significant. Um, uh, in one regional model that, that we use somewhat re regularly, um, by 2040, they presume 18% reduction in home-based work trips because of telecommute. Um, what they've done, though, is just looked at the last um, five to seven years of trends and then straight-lined it out as a, as a linear pattern. Um, so it's not maybe the best forecasting method, um, but it gives you an idea of what's being pulled into the practice of trying to forecast the future because it, it is a trend that we know is, is growing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned how with autonomous vehicles you would be able to do other things while you're traveling. Like, to what extent is that, like, could take nap while driving versus you still need to be awake and, or, like, multitasking enough to be able to monitor the car in event of emergency? Yeah, those are different levels of autonomy. Uh, the idea is that you're going to get to level four and level five. So level four, you, wouldn't, you, you could be engaged in any other activity. It's, it's more like getting in an elevator. Um, and that brings on a whole different set of questions, too. Um, 
one of the things that we um, tested, I'll go back here, I, I should have probably pointed this out. You'll see we have two bars. We have the private AV ownership and then shared. So shared just means presume there's a lot more uh, Uber and Lyfts running around and more people using them. We took 50% of the drive alone trips and just presumed they would share a ride. You still see VMT goes up in all those scenarios. So if people think that there is going to be this um, new scenario of the future where we end up with more people sharing uh, vehicles so there's going to be less congestion and less VMT and less emissions, that's not necessarily the case. If you, in, you know, decrease the cost of something, you can have a substantial increase, and this shows what that might look like. The other thing that we ran into, um, we do like to talk to behavioral uh, scientists about this kind of stuff. Any behavioral scientists in the room? Um, there's a, a couple groups that we've worked with where we get to ask them these fun questions about how people are going to behave in the future. One of the things they point out to us is one of the challenges of sharing, um, today people share uh, trips with you know, Uber Pool or Lyft Line because they know there's a, a third party driver that's a neutral third party that hopefully would be available to help if there's any altercation between the passengers. Um, how willing are you to get into a, a vehicle that doesn't have a driver and is like getting into an elevator, you've hit the button to your destination, and now you're locked in until it safely docks at the curb? Are you comfortable? And one of the things that um, Fair and Peers uh, is doing right now is we're doing a project with the city of LA is looking at how women travel. Do you think women will act differently than men in terms of the willingness to get into a car with a stranger and no driver? Um, some of the research we're looking at suggests they will act differently. Um, the other thing is, what is the social norm about driving uh, or riding in a driverless vehicle with a, with a fellow passenger? How many of you have used Uber Pool or Lyft Line? How long did it take you to figure out the social norm about how you should behave? Is it okay to talk on the phone, um, listening to your own music? Uh, you know, there are some rules that are evolving. When you get into an AV of the future, like this maybe offered by Uber or Lyft, same thing, what are the social norms? And if you want to test how people react to small changes, get into an elevator and face the back and don't face the door. <laughs> I love that experiment because people get a little disturbed. Um, even if you explain to them, hey, I'm a researcher, I'm just testing your reaction, they still don't feel, um, uh, feel any better about the, the discomfort that you've created. So those are some of the things that we have to figure out as we go. Yes? Um, I'd like to go uh, back one slide where you indicated that there's an increase in length of trips, uh, in, in mileage length of trips. So I'm wondering whether they calculated in um, if that's an increase where you can still get back home at night. Let's say you might increase, let's say that from here in the you'd only be typically willing to drive as far as Torrance. But now, now that you're not having to drive, you're willing to go as far as Long Beach or Laguna Beach or something, but you're still getting back home at night. There's no hotel cost. Is there, is there an increase in, in miles traveled if um, it goes over a certain length and people know that they're going to have to pay hotel costs? Yeah, so this current set of modeling basically presumes that the trip length frequencies that exist today would largely stay fixed. But because you lower the cost of travel, people could choose destinations further away and presume that they could come back home. Um, we didn't account for um, different situations such as the vehicle type of the future may change. It includes a bed. Um, how far are you willing to travel if there's a bed involved? Yeah, so we've not looked at, at some of those questions. And I'm going to get to a slide in a little bit that talks about the different types of vehicle offerings that we're likely to see and how that might influence your behavior in the future. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah. Are most of those AVs uh, going to be electric? Because that would reduce greenhouse gases. Yeah, so they were, uh, in, in most of the analysis and the predictions by us and others, it's presumed that they would l largely all be electric for a couple different reasons. Um, one, the distance that an electric vehicle um, could travel in terms of its lifespan. Right now, um, the forecast by about 2022 should be somewhere around 500,000 miles. Um, so if you're offering this in fleet service, you want to pick a vehicle that will basically go as far as possible for the least cost. So on your operating cost per mile, um, an electric car is going to be much more efficient than any kind of gas-powered or even hybrid. 
So yeah, the presumption is these will largely be electric um, by the time they start rolling out. That changes the formula. Even though there's more cars on the road, it would still reduce greenhouse gases because there's more electric cars than gas cars. It, it will depend on how the electricity is produced. Yeah, um, if you've got the right type of production, it's possible. If you don't, uh, it could uh, go the other way. Yeah, another question? So um, this is assuming uh, all these trip-based models and activity-based models are assuming that uh, current government policies towards autonom uh, well, uh, vehicles will apply to autonomous vehicles as well. So because understanding that certain cities like to impose their own restrictions and say, well, maybe at this hour we don't want this type of vehicle on the road or something like that, this is assuming that AVs will be treated the same way by city governments and policies as regular diesel cars. Yes, with one exception. One of the things we had to override in the model to plug in the freeway capacity, that, that car following headway, that the, the, the robots could basically follow much closer. Anybody remember from your California driving school what the safe headway on the freeway is from the, between you and the car in front of you? Yeah, think of it in seconds. How many, you know? Three seconds? Three, three seconds, um, some will argue two seconds. Three, se <laughs> um, three seconds is a safe following distance for the humans. When we went into our simulation model, that was the first thing we did. said, well, hmm, according to California Vehicle Code today, autonomous vehicles operating in autonomous mode must follow the vehicle code. That means they can't take advantage of their robot-like capabilities. They will have to be at three, three seconds. So we then went and said, well, hmm, what is the current headway in our simulation models based on current driver behavior? One of the models was from LA, one was from Northern California near Sacramento. Um, anybody want to guess at, at, at your Southern California headways today, what we observe on the freeways? Less than one second? Six tenths of a second. You guys are just a wee bit aggressive uh, down here in Southern California. So we actually had to override that particular aspect of the model and say, no, we're going to presume that the vehicle code will not apply in the future to, to AVs. They will be allowed to, to, to basically tailgate. Brought up a whole other issue in the simulation models. Um, freeway simulation models um, have different kinds of components. One of them is a driver behavior component. Um, there's a car following component as well. Uh, in the driver behavior, um, one of the things that uh, you're looking at is, is this car following response. And one of the things we didn't have in the model is what happens to humans when they get tailgated? How do you feel when you get tailgated? What's a response that you might have if someone's tailgating you? Brake, brake check. Brake um, check. Anybody speed up? Um, well, the brake check, that's a good one. Well, that's a little disruptive to freeway throughput. Um, and, but it's a real response that a human may, may, um, may show. Well, will they exhibit a different response if they know it's a robot tailgating them? Are you any more comfortable knowing it's a robot behind you or a computer versus another human? Um, robots will not respond to hand gestures or um, hard brakes. So those are some questions we don't have built into the models yet. We don't know exactly how humans will respond to being tailgated by a, com you know, a computer or a robot. Um, we know it creates discomfort. And that discomfort leads to current um, reactions, such as the hard break or, uh, um, or speeding up. So those are all factors that we'll need to, to think about. Um, great questions, though. But this gets us to, um, I think, for the policy. How many policy people do we have in here, by the way? Oh, quite a few of you, OK. Um, this gets to the fun part of planning. Um, what is the policy response we should be taking today to uh, help us achieve these, these desired future outcomes. So you can think of this as a teeter-totter. Um, if you look to the state of California and you look at the laws we've passed to encourage infill development, to be more sustainable, to encourage greenhouse gas reduction, to encourage VMT reduction, uh, to encourage active transportation, all of those point you in a direction where we need more vehicle travel to be shared in the future. Um, versus what we do today, which is a lot of private and mine, single occupant drivers. Um, if you're to achieve statewide goals, and many of those goals are shared by cities and counties, um, there needs to be a different balance, uh, if you will, compared to what we're, we're seeing today. And so it does depend on how we, um, how we measure things um, in terms of how we measure performance of the network, how we use that measurement to make changes to the network. And I'll give you a good example. 
Um, when I use the word congestion, and, and you picture congestion in your mind, what do you picture? Everyone want to volunteer? What? The five? <laughs> and what's happening on the four or five? Are the cars going fast or slow? <laughs> They're not moving. <laughs> They're not moving. OK. Slow moving in the parking lot. Yeah. So in, in most people's minds, if I use the word congestion, I've painted a picture for you of slow moving vehicles. Um, what if I told you that wasn't the best metric to analyze our transportation network? It's a symptom of the fact that we have very poor seat utilization in vehicles, which is caused by the way we price travel or don't price travel. Um, and here's an example of that. And this is really important because um, if you think about what we do in, in any kind of planning, um, if we go all the way back to where it starts, whether it's a community, a city, um, a county, a region, a state, you can ask three kind of basic questions to understand what's important to the people that live there and work there. Um, one of those questions is, what are you trying to protect? What do you not want to change? What are you trying to avoid in terms of if you're going to change something, what, what outcomes do you not want to happen? And then what are you trying to create? What's your desired future outcome? Those three buckets, we call them the community values buckets. Um, you can then take those statements of community values and express them as specific performance metrics. And if what you're trying to uh, uh, create is cars moving faster, okay, well, you don't do that through things like widening freeways. We know the induced travel effects will overwhelm them. Um, you need to somehow change the demand um, and create management systems that don't allow the, the di disruptive bottlenecks that occur. So one of the things that we did in a project in Salt Lake, um, this was a 100-mile corridor study. And it was originally motivated by a desire to address congestion on I-15. The cars were moving too slow. And we engaged, though, with the, the stakeholders to ask those kind of community value questions. And one of the fascinating things that came back to us was that um, part of what they were really focused on is making sure they were getting the most out of the current network they had already built. So yes, congestion was a problem. They recognized the cars were going slower than they um, desired. But they really wanted to understand how the network was performing before they made a major investment such as double-decking I-15. Um, so we introduced a new metric, seat utilization, because we knew congestion is a symptom. Um, and it's caused by the fact that in the US, we tend to want to drive any size vehicle, any time of day, to any destination, without any passengers, and without any parking costs or toll, and preferably, without anybody else parked at the front of the building so we can get our, our spot right next door. If that's the, the, the kind of cultural ex expectation, we want to better understand then what does that manifest itself to in terms of performance of the network. So when we measured seat utilization, this was um, looking at a more of an efficiency lens. We found that when you looked at the freeway in the peak hour, peak direction, there was over 25,000 empty seats. We couldn't find a section of the freeway that operated above about 35% seat utilization. Whereas we actually had some of the commuter rail and light rail lines operating at standing room only, 110% during the peak hour, peak direction. Um, so they were not using the existing resource, the, the, the roadway width, um, as efficiently as they could. Um, and it's because of the policies. They don't require you uh, to, to or they don't price things, or they don't have other incentives or disincentives that encourage a high degree of sharing of trips. So that's one of the things, if you really want to see the, the transportation network perform better with the existing physical space and commitments we've already made, you really do want to pay a close attention to a metric like seat utilization, because um, this is telling you how well your current operational policies, um, whether you price or not, whether you use ramp meters or not, um, is performing, and how well you're doing comparatively across some screen lines between transit and, and the freeway. Um, so this is a, a different way of looking at the same problem. This also relates to the private sector. Um, this is one of the slides I hope you'll remember. When we think about the policy response from the public sector, we need to pay very close attention to what the private market is doing. So in this example, um, we have to understand the profit motives of the private sector. So I don't want to pick on Uber or Lyft, but I will just for a moment. Um, if you look at their, their motivation, it's, it's a revenue motivation. And, and what's the formula? Well, it's miles, minutes, time of day, or the demand levels that exist at that time, and the availability of drivers, and your vehicle choice. 
Now pay a close attention to that vehicle choice. Um, this is a, a set of pictures from my, my Uber app in the suburbs where basically um, if you compare Uber and Lyft, the price of the trip is identical for the basic Uber X you know, or, or, or Lyft. Uh, where they start to deviate is on vehicle choice. Now this is the suburbs and I've got Uber X, Uber XL, Select, Black, SUV, I can get assistance, I can get a wheelchair, abled vehicle, or I can get a Spanish speaking driver. They're competing on vehicle choice. So think about the future. We now remove the driver and we can design vehicles to accommodate different things. Sleeping, we add the bed. Anybody up for Uber tailgate? I want to be able to order my tickets to the game and have a tailgate package complete with a vehicle that includes my ice chest of cold beverages of my choice um, and all my tailgating food preferences. Maybe it will be sponsored by my favorite beverage um, or maybe it'll be sponsored by a restaurant. Think about how the future will change. Any of you use Yelp on a regular basis? Think about how, how the, the future might work if you're on Yelp, you decide you and some friends are going to a, a pizza place you know, a couple miles away. So you ask for directions, you check it out. Oh, here's a notification pops up. We see you like to go to Domino's. Um, well, if you want to take Lyft, the pizza is free. Hey, um, we're going to go to Domino's. That makes your decision real easy. Or what if a competitor's ad comes up, you've already picked Domino's, you're in the vehicle, and, and you're ready to pay for the trip, and an ad comes up, hey, if you're willing to, to go to Shakey's Pizza over here, um, the, the pizza's free. Hey, driver, change routes, or there's no driver, you just program it in the, in the phone because there's no driver. Lots of different things can happen in the future from the private market standpoint because they're competing for your dollars. Um, there is a competitive component to here. Um, and, and so we want to be thinking about that in our, in our policy responses. We also, in most major cities, really need to do a better job of thinking about our network space allocation and priority. Almost all of the problems that may exist in the future with autonomous vehicles, because vehicles are large and consume space, and our cities are dense and don't have a lot of space for ground transportation, um, really need to do a better job of space allocation and priority. Um, this slide shows you the basic picture of how much extra space is consumed when we put the average 180-pound American into um, a 4,000-pound vehicle. And if you think about our vehicle sizes here and the fact that we typically have only you know, one or, or slightly more people in the, in the vehicle, it takes 17 cents a mile to move the mass of metal. It's about a penny, less than a penny to move the person. We have a lot of inefficiencies built into the, to the network. Um, here's an example also of, of reflecting on this in terms of um, how many people we can move um, in, in different modal formats. And this is not new. This stuff's been around for, for a long time. It's the fact that we don't put it into practice. And if you look at things like um, bus only or HOV lanes on arterials, um, you know, LA has some of the most severe congestion on the planet. How many miles of bus only lanes or arterial HOV lanes do you think the region has? Anyone want to venture a guess? It's a very small number. We don't even have to bother guessing. It's a very small number. So why in one of the most congested places, not only in the US, but on the planet, has there not been a decision to allocate some of that roadway space to the most uh, space efficient vehicles? Anybody want to guess why? Politics. Politics. Customer preference. Voter preference. Remember that any, 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 any cultural norm I described earlier? If we're going to make changes for the future, these are all the same solutions that we could be applying today. So if we're not applying them today, one of the, the fundamental questions that policy people need to, to be able to answer is, why? If it's not going to work today, what's, what's our belief or evidence that it will work 10, 15, or 20 years from now when we're in an AV future? Um, this is where the real risk or threat comes from. Further, we're seeing some of these disruptive changes play out right here in our, in our streets um, in terms of how we use that physical space. This is a study we did with Uber where we actually in San Francisco were measuring curb space use and we created a new metric um, that's largely based on curb productivity. You know, how much physical space is consumed within an hour um, and it's, it's broken up into little 20 foot sections based on the size of a, a parking space. And in San Francisco what we found is that 
for uh, a typical block face, um, park cars would, would stay there for about an hour um, and consume the entire 20 foot. And as you look to the left here from that parked car, shuttles, taxi, passenger loading, whether that was TNCs or um, private vehicles, and buses, there were a lot more people being delivered to and from the curb for those types of uses, but the space was not being allocated for that. So oftentimes, if you uh, pulled up in an Uber, you got out in the street because there was no curb space. Well, guess what? In an autonomous future, remember I gave you the um, elevator analogy earlier? The doors will remain locked until the vehicle pulls over safely to the curb. Everybody, anybody ever been on a bus where it's literally three feet from the curb, but it's not quite there, so they don't open the doors yet? That, that's the kind of frustration we could end up with in the future if we don't design our curbs differently and think about how this, this type of change manifests itself. Now, in a lot of places, though, giving up parking in front of storefronts is, again, politically not popular or acceptable. Um, despite this evidence, you could show a business owner, you can have 157 or 191 passengers dropped off at your storefront in the same hour that you allowed the one vehicle to park there. Isn't that a better trade-off? Even this kind of evidence sometimes is not sufficient to change the current status quo. Now, some things that could change, um, if we're going to talk about autonomy, let's talk about um, autonomous rapid transit. You know, one of the challenges for an autonomous vehicle is navigating our very complex street systems and driving conditions. Well, fixed route buses stay on the same route every day. Um, so it's one of the first places we could potentially test autonomy in a way to improve transit performance. We can also do things like in this example, this is from uh, Geary Street in San Francisco. We did a simulation where we had these little 20-passenger uh, and 4-passenger vehicles. You would call them up just like you do Uber or Lyft. You basically would go onto an app and say, I'm going from this origin to this destination. Um, it would be smart enough to know if there's other people near you that are going from the same origin to destination and put you in the same vehicle together. And if you have a median uh, transit-only lane, the great thing about popping into one of these vehicles, if everyone's going to the same place, you don't have to stop at every stop. You bypass them all. Just like being in a regular car and getting to that, that final destination that much faster. So there could be some substantial improvements in transit performance with taking advantage of today's technology, but you also have to be able to make the commitment of utilizing the road space a little differently, giving it to these, these more efficient modes. There's another aspect here that's important in terms of policy response. I gave you the example of the 4,000 pound vehicle. What if vehicle size has changed? Is, is that a policy response? Now, the way that uh, regulations and laws work in the, in, in the US, the federal government regulates the vehicle sizes and those kinds of things. States don't have that kind of control. Cities don't have that kind of control. Um, but I want to show you these two little simulations. The one on the left here. Um, this is a standard intersection with lots of uh, standard uh, sedan-sized vehicles. The one on the right, we've replaced them all with smart cars. Um, basically, if we're only you know, traveling with mostly one, pass you know, one person or, or maybe two at the most, what is the difference if vehicle size is shrunk? Um, it's dramatic. Um, basically, you can look at the delay for this intersection going from a, a level service F of 175 seconds of delay to 31 seconds for the same number of vehicles and people. Look at the fuel consumption drop. Um, this is uh, just based on the fact that uh, you have less, less delay. Um, now, we could also further this by changing them to electric vehicles, um, further dropping that. But physical space matters. And if we're going to continue to large, very large size vehicles, um, then you're going to consume more of the physical space. Yeah, Chip. Does the intersection have the same timing plan? We were able to optimize it because the small vehicles don't consume as much green time. So you basically can optimize the intersectional differently um, when you have uh, basically smaller cars. We actually um, tested this concept for a real uh, campus master plan. I can't name the campus. Um, but uh, one of the things they were struggling with is they wanted to expand. And they were having issues with they didn't have room for parking and they were going to have lots of impacts on, on intersection operations around the campus. Um, now, this was a private campus, not a public campus. So they had a lot of control over the vehicles that the people drove to and from the campus. So one of the options was replace all their vehicles. Um, this particular campus and, and, and institution um, has enough revenue to do things like that. 
Uh, so they could accommodate a very substantial increase in, in, in growing the campus size in terms of building and people by simply switching to smart cars. Um, they could park them two to the same physical space um, and they got all that extra green time so they could basically not impact the local street system. Um, so this is not too far out of reality uh, even for a, a single entity that has that much influence. But this is really something that would have to happen at the federal level um, in terms of big scale. We drop all of the two-hour delivery trucks. What's that? We drop all of the two-hour delivery trucks from your intersection. Oh yeah, well yeah. So that's one of the things that we 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 did. We presumed that all the delivery trucks could be made in the little cars because the packages weren't that big. So every truck that you saw in there, we gave it an equivalent number of smart cars. So one, I think one like one FedEx truck is two smart cars. Uh, yeah, that was our best best guess. Um, for the bigger trucks, like a you know a full uh, WB50 vehicle or something like that, um, I think it was five. Um, so that was our best guess. So we didn't totally drop them out of the, the simulation. Their packages are just in these smaller vehicles. Um, and Fatima leads uh, our freight group, so she has to look at the world of automation through a freight lens, which creates a whole different set of opportunities and challenges. So if you want to um, talk about those, we can cover those in, in the discussion. And this slide's a good one for that. Um, when we talk about this, the vehicles will have to come to the, the curb face and dock. Um, that's for both passenger vehicles and freight vehicles. So one of the challenges we're running into, in, especially in crowded cities, uh, is this competition for curb space. Um, and what is the city's policy on who has a priority or preference, goods or passengers? We even had a project um, with one private developer who wanted to own their entire, they owned a whole block of a, of a city, and they were going to do a mixed-use project. It was going to be basically uh, retail on the ground floor, some office, residential, and hotel. They wanted to own the whole curb face because they wanted to dictate the priority or preferences for who could get dropped off at the front of the building. Um, and they wanted to do it dynamically. This particular hotel was going to have lots of different events. Um, that would include things like politicians and celebrities. Certain people were more important than other people. Certain packages were more important than other packages. They wanted to be able to even negotiate with a separate individual freight companies, FedEx versus U UPS, for example, um, to charge one more than another if they want to drop off at the front door versus going around to the back and the longer distance to get into the building. Those are some of the new planning questions we're running into. And in San Francisco, we did create a new model, a curb demand model for freight and passenger demand to help understand the utilization of that uh, particular space. Um, all it tells you, though, is the demand. It doesn't tell you how to prioritize or set preferences on how to, to accommodate that demand. Uh, Fedeman, anything else you want to mention about the, the freight side? No? OK. OK. Don't need a curbside. Well, and, and if you think about freight, the other aspect of disruption, um, we were doing some work with the University of um, San Francisco and one of their medical campuses. They have a huge amount of deliveries every day for a lot of sensitive medical uh, equipment and supplies um, that come in these totes. Um, and, and they have a, a different distribution center where they all kind of get together and they have to um, take multiple trucks to bring them to campus at different times of day when there's not traffic congestion. That's one of the things they're sensitive to. Um, they want to know, well, is there some better way to get these little totes to us and into the building and to the ultimate destination without humans touching it? Sterilization, things like that were, were factors they were thinking about. If we can have a mechanical robot deliver it from its beginning all the way into the building um, independently without a bunch of humans touching it or breaking things, um, that would be preferred. That's a whole different way of thinking about the future than we uh, traditionally have. So in the light of trying to understand what else could we do, um, we decided to think about what we call countermeasures or policy responses. Countermeasures sounds a little, I don't know, um, a little more aggressive. Um, and it, it does feel like public sector agencies may need to be a little bit more aggressive with their policies or their regulations. And so one of the things we want to test is if we don't like the VMT increases, and as a public agency, you don't want to see your transit ridership decline, what are the things you can do? So we tested some basic um, things. Pricing is a very common one. Um, 
What happens if you use shared ride incentives? Um, goods movement. Um, what if there is a, a, a way through 3D printing, for example, to, re to reduce freight demand? And then even things like uh, transit enhancements, uh, the autonomous transit vehicles that we mentioned, um, and new technology solutions, drone deliveries, for example. What happens if we were to test some of these in the models? Now, not all these are easy to test in the models. Some were. Um, and we engaged with a Delphi panel to help us understand some of the, uh, some of the options and some of the best, uh, the best strategies that they thought might be most effective. And here were the results. So those same models that we used before, we took three of them, three of the ones we found to be more sensitive to these, these input variables. And this is what we found. We could basically take um, these market-driven conditions, um, absent any re regulations or countermeasures, and flip them. Basically, you could actually reduce VMT if you're willing to take advantage of um, things like pricing and, and incentives to, to share more rides. That was distinctly possible. We could even offset the transit ridership losses by making the transit system more competitive. Um, one of the things that we realized early on through a lot of the work we were doing is transit systems in most urban places have not had to compete. Um, and a lot of them have had a very challenging dual mandate to provide complete geographic coverage as well as they try to, you know, encourage or increase ridership. That's very difficult to do. The best transit corridors or transit areas are those with fixed high densities where there's a natural attraction between one origin and another uh, destination. Um, if you don't have that, um, you know, fixed route transit is very difficult to operate effectively. And so as Uber, Lyft, bike share, scooter share have come along and now are competing for some of the core markets of transit, we're starting to see that transit agencies themselves are trying to understand how, how to better compete. There's a number of options that available to them um, through these types of countermeasures or, or policy responses. Which ones will be most effective is, is somewhat easy to analyze. One of the challenges we, we ran into though was if you think about how public transit agencies work, there's federal rules, there's state rules that govern how they function. Um, if you think about how Uber and Lyft operate, there's almost no rules um, in some cases. So the playing field is very different for an Uber or Lyft operator versus a public transit agency that are both trying to, to serve the same set of passengers. Now they have different fares, the public transit is still a lot cheaper, um, but as Uber and Lyft go from drivers to no drivers, their costs decrease. They're also much more convenient. Um, the travel times are, are much faster. So transit could look at TNCs on the ground today and, and think forward that they're only going to get more competitive. Um, so transit needs to think about how are they going to become more convenient, more comfortable, uh, more travel time competitive. And unless they do things like take advantage of the autonomy and change their system and have the ability to have transit only lanes, it's going to be very difficult, especially for the bus transit, to compete effectively. And we don't really need models to tell us that, but we can, and the models will, will quantify it for us. But we can offset that effect um, by making transit much more competitive. So hopefully this is giving you some idea of what we anticipate is likely to happen under current market conditions. The fact that there are policy responses and countermeasures available, though, that public agencies could engage in. One big takeaway, though, is many of these countermeasures or policy responses are available today. And the agencies are choosing not to employ them because of some of the political constraints that we've, we've talked about. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we remove some of those political constraints? Is it, is it education? Do people need to better understand how inefficiently the current system works? Do we need to do something different? Those are great questions for students of planning, policy, or engineering to be taking on now because obviously in practice, we have not come up with a set of ideal solutions such that these things are, are actively being deployed in, in lots of different cities. Um, with that, we can tackle any questions that you guys haven't already answered.